All right, welcome everybody, and thank you for taking the time to join us for another Fit Nation Lunch and Learn. Today, we have another incredible guest out of the UK joining us. Uh, I think for many people in the industry, he doesn't really need an introduction. His name is David Minton. He is the director at the Leisure Database Company. And in this session, we're going to dig into a few topics ranging from yeah, how to use data to give your facility a competitive advantage, ageism in the fitness industry, uh, and why that's a missed opportunity for many operators, the role that politics plays in the fitness industry and how we can influence it. And finally, David's outlooks and predictions for the industry, something that uh, he is definitely qualified to speak about. It's our pleasure to have you on the show. Without further ado, David, thank you for taking the time to join us. Alex, thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be with you. Nice. Excellent. Um, always a great starting point, maybe for our, for our listeners who aren't familiar with you. Uh, can you give us a little bit about your background and, and tell us about what you do? Sure. So uh, I'm the founder of the, the Leisure Database Company, and we've been editing and auditing the industry for the past 20 years. So that means that we have a great insight into the facilities uh, that uh, the, we have across the industry. So for those of you uh, listening outside the UK, you might be interested to know that we pre COVID, we had 7,239 fitness sites. Uh, collectively, they had 10.4 million members. And our market value was 5.1 billion. And the penetration rate, we think it was good at 15.6. But when you look at the overall uh, potential, uh, it's, it's very low. So the industry needs to do something about that. So we know so much about these facilities. Um, we know, for example, that 84% of the population live within just two miles of them. But the problem is that we only have, as I say, this 15.6% actually going. So there's a big mismatch between the potential and the actual take up. Okay, excellent. And, and for yourself, I mean, how, how did you really land in the world of fitness as a career? Oh, that was completely by accident. Um, so uh, I was working in radio and television, uh, doing community programming, and uh, realized that there was no information about this growing fitness uh, industry. Uh, so we decided to compile a database and start uh, auditing it. Okay. So necessity being the mother of all invention there, you, you heard or you, you saw that something needed it and then you decided to take some action and get it going. Nice. Exactly. Exactly. Cool. And it always, you know, from my perspective, I think it's always interesting. You're a big data guy. What, what things really make you tick in terms of gathering a lot of these data points and insights? Like, like well, what, what's the driving force here for you? Well, well, I suppose that there's, um, there's the fascination uh, uh, as a uh, having done sociology, this fascination of how people come together and we we do things uh, collectively, um, but there's also a huge frustration as well. Um, so, as I say, we know so much about the, the the actual supply to the industry, but we don't really understand much about the demand. So. When you think that in the UK, we have over 50 CRM providers and they have over a hundred platforms and some are still on DOPS. Yeah. Um, so of those, uh, and, and there's a th about a third of those 7,000 sites that don't even have CRM. So, <laughs> so uh, how they manage the business and how they understand and get value from that business and <clears throat> how they get a return on their investment to that CRM uh, is always a bit of a mystery to me. The other thing that um, I'm wondering is, um, in our normal lives with uh, <clears throat> phones um, and, uh, uh, and smart TVs, we get automatic updates. So you know, the, the Tesla just updates the software overnight. You know? the, the iPhone just updates it overnight. 
why doesn't CRM providers offer free updates overnight? I mean, it, it just seems so strange. There are so many uh, operators who I know that are still operating the same system that they did 10 years ago because uh, they don't want to pay for the upgrades and they're afraid now to uh, move from that. Um, and it seems such a shame that uh, that's holding the industry back. Change can be scary, can it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, very. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's, that's, that's the problem. I think that's uh, probably where a lot of yeah, operators found themselves in a really tricky spot once the pandemic started because they've been so reluctant to change in the years leading into that. And then, yeah, it, it really hit the fan there uh, and they weren't really yeah. able to adapt. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And, and, and here's another uh, statistic that I find uh, fascinating. So we know that 62% of the sites have got studios, but only 49% of, of those do class bookings. Uh, so again, you know, there's a complete mismatch, you know? Yeah. So I, I can't name names, uh, otherwise I'd get into trouble. But if I turn up at, uh, at what my nearest uh, uh, fitness site, uh, and I go for a class, then I get the rubber band around my wrist. Uh, and then I give that rubber band in as I go in. And I think to myself, are we in the 21st century or what? Huh? Rubber bands? Huh? Yeah. <laughs> and then, of course, th there's no way that they know that I've really done that class. You know, I could have got diverted and gone and done something else. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so... So in our, in our daily online retail lives and our online travel lives, we're so used to personalization. Um, and there's no personalization in the industry. Um, and it, again, seems such a shame. Um, and, and there's certainly no hyper-personalization uh, mm -hmm. about the fact that you know, I, I do the same class on a Friday, five o'clock. Uh, and what if it's selling out uh, by Wednesday? Huh? Um, you know, there's no system where they can say, oh, David, you know, uh, there's only two places left. Uh, you always come on a Friday. Do you want one? Yeah. Yeah, we're definitely not there yet. I, I would agree with that. On oh, that good. note of personalization, <laughs> <then>. yeah. <laughs> Uh, on that note of personalization, because I, I agree, like in, in the retail environment and a lot of other sectors, they are really hitting their stride here. And there's a lot of technology that can support that as well. Um, yeah. I mean, would you say there's any ways you think operators can at least take the first steps in personalization, whether that's yeah using this technology or maybe even not even using technology, but leveraging some data points they have to boost that personalization factor for their members? Well, uh, the, I, I love visiting uh, sites in Scotland, for example. Uh, so if I go to uh, any site in Scotland, uh, then it's a bit like Cheers. Uh, everyone knows your name. Uh, they are embedded in the community. Uh, they're small communities and people just know their names. Well, that's a great start, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, to know, know the customer's name. Uh, uh, they, and they, generally speaking, know what the customer does, um, but they don't have any communication with that customer outside. Um, and they don't necessarily know what the customer does outside. Um, uh, some are very good in if the customer is doing an event or training for something particular, then they can help. But... Generally speaking, it's more a case of what happens within those four walls. Now, I know there are some operators that are, uh, that, that are developing systems and are systems already in place that are encouraging uh, more uh, in the whole, shall we call it, um, in the round access to uh, more data. Uh, but the number of people that are taking that up is very small so far. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, and I know you said a lot of the work that you guys do as a business is confidential for obvious reasons. Um, could you, however, though, shed some light on some of the top line data metrics that, that you would look to provide to some of your clients uh, and then why that's important 
and positioning them for growth. So maybe some people listening to this sure. can uh, yeah, either utilize that yourselves or, or let you guys do it for them. Sure. So one of the things that uh, I really love is going around the, uh, to different countries and talking about the, the, the granular detail that we go into uh, when we're doing site analysis work. Um, and, and I love it because it's very rare that I come across an example where someone's doing something similar. So we would look, we have a supply demand model um, and we've developed it obviously over many years. Uh, so we know in great detail about the supply because we hold around 200 fields of data on each site. But the more important thing is the demand. So lots of our clients provide us with their postcodes of their live members. And then we're able to geocode those and then give them a type of one of 66 types. And we're able to allocate that across the 1.9 million postcodes in the UK. And that gives us a propensity factor for each of those 66 types and how it changes across the 1.9 million postcodes. And that is all built into our algorithm that then produces what we call the latent demand. So the latent demand is taking into account all the 7,239 sites. It's taking into account the, the knowledge that we have of the 10.4 million uh, members. And we have around 4 million of those in our model. Um, and it takes into account the concentrations of the different types of people uh, that are living within the core catchment area. And the propensity factor will change um, um, for, for those types, um, depending on the numbers of those types. So uh, that's the sort of detail that we go into uh, for both the public and private sector in the uh, UK. Oh, okay. And, and from, a, let's say, looking at say a gym who's maybe not based in the UK or just someone who's trying to understand how they can use data to better give themselves a competitive edge. It's one of the themes of what we want to talk about today. Would you highlight maybe one or two key data points that they can be looking to in order to separate themselves from their local competition? Well, I think I, I know uh, both in America and in Japan where, you know, I visit a lot. Uh, people literally walk the streets uh, to, uh, to, to look um, because it's very difficult to get this breakdown uh, at a sensible price um, uh, in, in other countries. Um, and geodemographics have worked brilliantly for us for the last 12 years. But I don't think that they've really kept up to date with the changes in society. And they certainly haven't kept up to date with the huge changes uh, with uh, social media. Mm -hmm. So we're now looking to layer um, something called spatial AI on top of our geodemographics so that we have more of an understanding of the social media activity in an area as well. Okay. So social media being one, okay, that, that people can be using to try and get themselves that different competitive edge. Um, yeah. On the flip side, would you say there's any overrated or maybe overemphasized data in the fitness industry that people are relying on too much that you would say, personally, I would probably look away from that? Yeah, so, uh, so people buy our state of the industry report each year and they see what the penetration rate is. So if the penetration rate is 10%, then they say, ah, so we'll take a, the total population area of whatever, 15 minutes, 20 minutes, uh, and we'll take 10% of that. Yeah. They, sadly, they have no idea what they're doing. Okay. 
Yeah, because yeah, they're, they're especially these days as more digital models start to shift. Um, it, that's that just seems like there's a huge missed opportunity. They probably should be yeah. looking at why those ninety percent of those people in their area aren't becoming members of a gym, right? Absolutely, absolutely. That that brings us on to the very next uh, question. Yes. Huh? yes, it does. Yeah, the the other big topic we wanted to talk about was member age demographic shifts in the industry. Um, yeah, and then also yeah, the the ageism in the industry today. So yeah, lots to unpack okay. there, but but yeah, let's go for it. Uh, yeah. So without a doubt, the conversation needs to move to how we can age better, uh, and how do we liberate the fitness industry from its ageism? So in the physical activity space, fitness is without doubt the most ageist. So when I when I qualified thanks to the Central Y in London, uh, as a, a group cycling instructor. Uh, I went along to my first class and the receptionist asked me if I'd cycled before. And when I got into the studio, someone very helpfully suggested that I should sit at the back and stay out the way. Uh, it came as a complete surprise to everybody that I was the instructor. Uh, and, um, and, and what we have just gone through with COVID, we know that the vast majority of people that have died of COVID were over 70. And yet the industry itself has less than 1% of the population that are over 70. Um, now, we also know that the world's oldest society is Japan. Where, where I work on a regular basis. And they already know that better healthcare can help keep independence longer. And the country is experiencing this super aging society with around a third of the population over 60. Isn't that incredible? Okay. Um, and I know that even 90 year olds can improve their balance through simple exercises. So it's never too late to start. Um, so I'm really surprised that the industry totally ignores this aging uh, population, which is the largest section of our population. So the fitness industry in the UK is really serving the 18 to 30 year olds. Um, and as I say, less than 1% are over 70. Mm -hmm. So if uh, what we have just gone through with COVID, the government said that they follow the science. So one of the things that the government asked the industry was of the 7,239 gyms and the 10,000.4 million members, can you tell us how their health is better than the average member of the rest of society. So in other words, do they get a, an outcome of going and how often do they go uh, and what do they do when they go? Well, there's just so little data about that. So, so yeah, there, are, there are very few occasions when generations have the opportunity to completely reset public opinion and the effects on behavior change. But I really believe that post COVID, that we have that opportunity. And if we can get to uh, exercise for the masses, that could be a legacy for the global pandemic, then that would be an amazing legacy, wouldn't it? Yeah, absolutely. And I think there is a, you know, we, we've talked about this, and I think a lot of other people in the industry are talking about it right now, is the shift towards health as a reason for going to a fitness club rather than an aesthetic. So, you know, yeah. it's not just about biceps and, and flexing in the mirror anymore. It's really about health and, and well-being and long-term just, yeah, overall feeling good and, and you know, being physically active. Yeah. Um, in your opinion, how can the operators, uh, not only in the UK, but just how can operators globally cater to and uh, let's say yeah, capture this new opportunity 
that would be the expected influx of the yeah the 60 plus age group into their facilities what can they do well, to, to make sure they <clears throat> capture that uh well i mean uh what 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 one of the things is that we have to accept that we have uh, an obesity crisis uh, as well as a global warming crisis um and if we just think about the uh, obesity crisis for a second then uh Fat lives matter. Hmm? Uh, and where's the campaign about fat lives matter? Hmm? Mm -hmm. uh, old lives matter. Where's the campaign for that? Hmm? So within, since uh, 2018, um, a schoolgirl called Greta single-handedly went and sat in front of the Swedish parliament with a sign. Four years later, she's been nominated for a Peace Prize three times. She has, uh, in over 100 countries, every Friday, hundreds of thousands of children demonstrating. And this Greta effect has put global warming on the, every government's agenda. Mm -hmm. And we're going to see... Uh, we, we in the UK are hosting uh, COP26 uh, in November, and we are going to see, I think, lots of initiatives uh, for uh, reducing greenhouse gases. Well, hang on a second. Over the same period of time, we have had an obesity crisis that's got worse. What on earth uh, have governments been doing about that? So interestingly, both Japan and China have both said, oh, we have to improve the health of the nation. And so they have initiatives. We've also seen something uh, similar in Singapore. But uh, as far as I'm aware, there aren't any European countries that are saying the same thing. And we haven't got any what we would call leveling up taking place mm -hmm. uh, in, in the UK. So our prime minister has been working out in the grounds of Buckingham Palace, which most people would know. He's been playing tennis in the American ambassador's residence. And he's been jogging around Lambeth Palace, the home of the Archbishop of Canterbury. And what he discovered was that doing that with his security guards didn't actually help. So he took a personal trainer. So he's now working out with a personal trainer on a regular basis. Well, what if he said, okay, I'm privileged, but what if I give a personal trainer to everyone in the country that would like one? Well, first of all, the industry couldn't cope, but that's <laughs> another thing. You know, it's, it's the direction of travel that yeah. we've got to go in. So in the January edition of Men's Health, the, there are, 21 of the biggest health and fitness trends of 2021. And I'm one of the men's health advisory boards. Uh, and, and so one of the things in there, in fact, it's number nine, just in case anyone's going to look it up, uh, is we've got to become more political as an industry. I mean, we are just... Uh, basically, the government just don't pay any attention to us. Um, they pay lip service to us, in fact, because we can't prove anything. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and we can't prove enough. And the problem is that they have so many other uh, uh, priorities. So we have to look at how the climate activism changed the government's agenda. And we have to do something similar. Yeah, no, I think that's a that's a really good yeah that's a really good shout, and especially because too, if you think about the the impact that, that could have, not only for the health of the people, but then also, I mean, the everyone stands to win. The fitness industry will recover stronger. You know, they're going to be targeting members, uh, potential members who have more disposable income than they probably have yeah. had. Um, yeah. You know, they have more time than the average exactly. working professional. And they also exactly. have probably more attention to, to retaining their health as well. Um, exactly. So yeah, I, I totally agree that it is something. It's, 
needs a grassroots movement. Um, it needs something, you know, like that big event or that, that kind of catalyst like a Greta uh, to yeah. potentially get it going. And, and so from, yeah, as we shift more towards the, the politics, we've already touched on it a little bit, but yeah, starting in our own bubble, how, how do you think the fitness industry, well, I think I know where we're, what your answer is going to be, but how do you think the fitness industry responded to the crisis? Uh, in short, not well enough. Yeah. Um, so, uh, so the politicians had scientists either side of them almost seven days a week um, telling us and showing us all these charts. Um, and for the first time since the 1940s, our government actually said, you should be exercising. You should be exercising for one hour a day. Um, Okay, we had a few celebrities on TV. Uh, the fitness industry went digital and uh, we had thousands of people going to digital channels and saying, this is, follow me, here's an exercise, uh, follow me. But we never had a expert uh, standing up next to the politicians saying, now about the one hour's exercise, could we suggest the following? Mm -hmm. there, was, there was nothing that was uh, at that level. Um, and the industry, for the first time, actually took civil servants round to show them uh, the fitness sites um, because so many civil servants and politicians had never been in a fitness facility. Well, you know, if we've only got 15.6% of the penetration rate, uh, then uh, there's obviously loads of people that uh, are just put off. So if we, if we come back to the ageism thing, mm -hmm. <laughs> which is a pet project uh, of mine, just simply because um, I've been through it with my mother. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, so my mother, I had to go sit through uh, the care package that um, my mother had to sign up to when she came out of hospital so that she could remain independent. The care package was all based around health and safety and the people that are coming in to the home. Uh, it was based on food, it was based on uh, washing, and it was based on dressing. Now, I, as I said to them, well, where's the exercise? Mm -hmm. huh? Where, what part of the package includes exercise? Uh, my mother's balance is getting worse. You know, what, what part of the package helps her with that? That's what's important to her. Um, and they said, oh, we don't do that. And again, that's such a, a great example of um, ageism, where, you know, the, 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 as far as society is concerned, basically the care package is just, looking after the person in their home. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I came to the conclusion that um, there is a compression of more morbidity model, which shows how an unhealthy lifestyle affects morbidity twice as much as mortality. And my mother proved that because in her 80s, she got a yoga teacher. And in her 90s, she got a personal trainer. Only because... Uh, she knew that her balance uh, uh, wasn't as good as it, it was. And she was worried about falling over. She didn't want to hurt herself. So, uh, so we had um, uh, these, uh, uh, these people coming in. And it wasn't the yoga that, that most people know. It wasn't the personal training that most people know. But simple exercises, getting her in and out of the chair, that mm -hmm. gave her confidence. Um, and it maintains that uh, she had an independent life for much longer. Yeah. And I, th I think that's exactly it when you talk about how we approach these sort of things. So, yeah, when, when you think personal trainer and a 90-year-old woman, uh, it, it's, it almost clashes in your mind because you think that they're going to be at the gym doing push-ups and stuff like that, but it's actually just about <laughs> movements, right? It, it's, it's about yeah. just making sure that they're not sitting for 20, you know, for, for their entire day and not doing anything. And so 
reframing how we can do that. I think that sounds like a, a good way that we can, yeah, as an industry start to, to grow and adapt to this, uh, the, these oncoming challenges. The oldest British woman to compete in an Ironman triathlon was 74. I mean, you know, she's Iron Grand. Yeah. I mean, she's amazing. And, and then uh, after the uh, 2012 Olympics, she set up this organization called Silverfit. And now they have, uh, they, they just do around a dozen activities uh, all over London, but they do senior gym, they do walking football, they do senior circuits. I, and you know, they understand uh, the difficulties that people have. Mm -hmm. um, uh, at that age uh, the, I, we, we also have an organisation in the UK called Ramblers and uh, you know, they, they do what it says uh, they go walking and now they have the Ramblers walking for health and it aims that everyone will have access to a short, free and friendly walk um, and the number of people that are going on those walks just grows and grows and grows so there are all these other organizations that are doing things. And I just feel that the fitness industry uh, still, although I've pointed it out over many years, still completely misses the point. Yeah. Okay. And, and so how would you say someone who, who's listening to this and they agree it's also an issue, how can an individual on like the ground floor of the fitness industry, someone who doesn't have their, their hands in public policy or anything like that, how can they do their part to start influencing this and, and hopefully, you know, together start to just get this snowball effect going? Well, um, in, in Holland, um, I went to a fabulous site uh, that Theo Hendricks uh, is uh, managing. And there uh, they, you have a fitness site downstairs and you have mixed aging group population living upstairs. And he included the people upstairs. So he got them uh, cooking lunch. He got them doing social activities. And, and then he, eventually they said, oh, can we go walking in the swimming pool? And so then he had groups of people uh, doing uh, easy activities. And then they went and told their mates. And the whole thing just snowballed. Mm -hmm. um, and... I, we see that in uh, the UK as well. There are lots of examples where the public sector especially uh, are encouraging uh, older population. We, we also have some of the private sector that are offering very low monthly subscriptions uh, to people uh, that, are, uh, that are in their 60s and 70s. Mm -hmm. I think that, again, let's look at people like Mick Jagger. I mean, you know, these aging rock stars refuse to grow old. <laughs> and so, so the industry, it, we, a few years ago, uh, Sport England had a campaign, 50 plus. Well, I mean, if you try to uh, do a 50 plus campaign now, they'd, they'd just laugh at you. I mean, mm -hmm. it would be ridiculous. Uh, but so 60 is the new 50, or is it even 70 is the new 50? Huh? And so we have to think completely differently um, uh, about aging. Yeah, yeah, and then just yeah, part, using that. I mean, there there is inclusion in that as well, right? So so just including yeah. that that group in that bracket. Okay. Yeah. And we've talked about it a little bit. I mean, I think the the personal trainer for everyone who wants it, it would be a a great initiative, but would be very difficult, if not impossible, to get off the ground. Um, but how how do you think politicians? can actually help rather than, uh, you know, they see the prime minister who plays tennis every now and then. Uh, what can a politician actually do here if you had your uh, magic wand that, <laughs> to get them moving? Well, for the last 50 years, uh, basically uh, politicians in this country uh, have totally ignored the concept of improving the health of the nation. So improving the health of the nation basically only happens uh, after a war. So it mm. happened after the First World War here, and it happened after the Second World War. And of course, we still have the legacy of the National Health Service, which started after the Se Second World War. Um, so uh, the, uh, we've only had two prime ministers since the Second World War, uh, Major and Blair, that actually encouraged people in a very positive way 
to actually do more sport uh, and become fitter. Um, but the problem is that there's no follow through. So uh, let me give you an example. So in 2012, our GB team um, won 67 medals. It was a, a record. Uh, and then four years later in Rio, uh, they got even more. Uh, so the cost of each medal is worked out in the greatest of detail. Um, and the price is just over 4 million per medal. Now, it's great, but it doesn't actually encourage the vast, vast population to take up any of those sports. Um, in Sydney, they actually found that the Olympics had a detrimental health uh, effect on the population because people lay on their sofas going, wow, that's fantastic, drinking another beer, uh, and basically saying, well, there's, no, there's no way I could ever do that. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and so didn't, uh, didn't uh, take up any, uh, uh, any uh, new sport uh, after their Olympics. So, so we spent just over 4 million per medal um, in London and then again in Rio. And there was no practical budget uh, placing in uh, uh, where we could encourage the rest of the nation to do mm -hmm. something. Um, the, the, some, uh, some sports clubs weren't even ready to take up the number of people that actually wanted. So, so when said co um, years ago, um, won, uh, won his uh, wonderful medals. Uh, he came back to uh, his Haringey uh, Athletic Club um, and there was a queue all the way around the block. Um, and he was going, wow, yeah? how do we cater for, cater for this? Uh, um, and, and, and what if we had the similar situation with the fitness sites? Yeah. Uh, uh, so... Uh, so we do have to uh, rethink the way the industry uh, is thought of in society, but we also have to rethink of the way that the industry, our industry, um, caters for people both in and outside the gym. Mm -hmm. I think for yeah, from the public health side, from what I'm hearing from you, it sounds like there's there's like a momentum problem. Everything there's like these siloed efforts, but they never really build upon each other. So yeah. another one there could be that, yeah, just, just making sure that one supports the growth of the other, which then in turn supports the growth of the other and so on and so on and so on, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And one of the frustrations, of course, is the very fact that we have situations where local authorities and, uh, and well-meaning uh, governing bodies, uh, and they, uh, they set up test uh, sites, test examples. Uh, would this work? So they set it up and then they expect it to work without any further funding. Uh, you know, it's a bit like, <clears throat> uh, you know, we, we, we've only briefly mentioned climate change, but, <clears throat> but climate change needs huge investment uh, in new technology. Mm -hmm. um, and since Paris, there has been over 4 billion of new money coming in. Um, and you can read about that in Bill Gates's uh, book. Um, uh, and again, there's no new money coming in to uh, cope with the uh, obesity uh, uh, issues that we have in this country. Mm -hmm. We spend a lot of money, but it doesn't achieve anything. So we, so we need to completely rethink. Mm -hmm. Okay. It is also, it's, it's a pandemic, the obesity crisis. It's been labeled a pandemic in places like America a decade ago. And yep. however, it didn't really have the same uh, effect that our most recent yep. one did uh, because it is, it's just slower 
you know, you know slower happening. It's, it's not really as immediate, it's just something like that. So yeah, I, I think calling more attention to that, the fact that it is really a health crisis that is just as dangerous and led into the bad effects of our current one. Um, yeah. That, that can also be one to really just start spring some change. Yeah. So, <clears throat> I mean, what, there, there, are, there are two figures really um, that we should think about. Um, so there's around 50 billion tons of uh, CO2 uh, going into the atmosphere every year. Um, and uh, the, uh, the scientists tell us that we should be aiming for zero. And the scientists estimate that we have saved around 5,000, uh, uh, sorry, so, so let me start again. So there are 50 billion uh, tons uh, of CO2 gases going into the uh, atmosphere each year, and we should be aiming for zero. The scientists reckon over the last 12 months, without anyone flying anywhere or traveling anywhere, that we have saved around 5 billion. So that's 45 million that we're still producing uh, yeah. somewhere, somehow, uh, that we have to uh, do something about. Now, in terms of exercise, our National Health Service suggests that we should be doing 150 minutes of moderately intensity uh, activity um, uh, a week. But we also know that, or well, they tell us, that they estimate there's around 40% of the population that's doing zero. So again, you know, we have the, these uh, numbers. Now, both numbers, um, are estimates, um, yeah. you know, because we just don't know enough. Um, but both climate change and obesity is in the news almost daily, and rightly so. Um, and so, I, to come back to my earlier point, um, climate change gets a darn sight more publicity, um, and it's attracted uh, politicians, um, uh, Apple have now said, for example, the largest company in the world uh, has said by 2030 it will be uh, net zero. Uh, it's, uh, and it's made a promise to do that. Uh, uh, you can watch the video on YouTube. Uh, but it's also said, ah, if you're one of our suppliers, you have to make the same promise. Yeah. Exactly. Now, what if Apple then also said, okay, through Fitness Plus, uh, we're going to uh, encourage all our, uh, all our um, uh, employees and we're going to encourage all uh, the employees of our suppliers and the millions of people around the world that uh, have this uh, to, to do more activity in and out of the, um, uh, I I the um, home and gym. Uh, so they're going to encourage us to close our rings. What if all the major ecosystems started doing that? No? What if you know, uh, new organizations uh, started to do that? And people like the World Health Organization and the United Nations, as I've already mentioned, you know, the UN are already doing something on climate change. Uh, what if they were forced to do something on obesity? Yeah. Um, cool. Yeah. Yeah. We shall see. Yeah. If, yeah. Uh, if we can ever get something like that off the ground. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. And, and starting to turn towards one of the, one of the last topics that um, I think it would be really valuable to get your insight on. It's about customer trends and industry outlook. Uh, yeah. I know, I know this quote uh, has been, well, it follows you around quite a bit. It's a good quote for, for good reason. You know where I'm going with this. Um, yeah, you, you've described our industry pre-COVID uh, as being in a golden age. And so the golden age meant that we had the highest penetration rates yet, the highest member counts yet. There was rapid tech improvement. Um, and then, of course, yeah, it's, it's hard to think of a darker period than the last 13 months. In your opinion, yeah. or, or based on the data that you guys are collecting, how soon do you think that the fitness industry would be back in this golden age territory? Uh, or subsequently, do you think we left it? Um, two years. Okay. So without a shadow of a doubt, it will come back. 
And I actually think it will come back stronger because mm -hmm. I think there will be a greater emphasis on self-care. So I think this new era of lifestyle where values are placed on personal care, family, wider community spirit, uh, I think that that will start to penetrate all the way through uh, society. Um, and, and again, I, 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 I hate to keep mentioning my mother, but uh, you know, she uh, willingly had a tracker um, so that she could monitor uh, the activity. Now, obviously, she was doing so little compared to others, but you can set those things so that uh, you could just monitor it so that you just do a little bit more than you did yesterday. Mm -hmm. That's the starting point for so many people, uh, almost 40% of the population. Um, so I think the greater emphasis on self-care, uh, the industry needs to work out how it starts with those people um, and whether it starts... Uh, actually outside uh, the four walls. So I think that there's also going to be a growing focus on non-exercise activity, this thermogenics, uh, where small daily changes make a difference. Um, and again, once people understand that, I think that that would be really good. Um, and then there's the playful new initiatives uh, that are motivating self-care. Uh, with unconventional activities like planting trees. Well, mm -hmm. that does uh, two things, doesn't it? Uh, uh, and, and so you're doing the carbon offsetting and um, local gamification apps like Street Tag uh, are encouraging multi-generational neighbourhood camaraderie. So volunteering to care for the environment could be seen as an altruistic way to burn calories. How wonderful is that? Yeah. And, okay. yeah. Uh, and I'm now encouraging pro pro any fitness site that has actually got outdoor space, and there are pub lots of public sector sites that have, to set aside space for a garden uh, mm -hmm. and grow your own. So uh, I think that we're going to have more of the con concern about um, this greater emphasis on self-care. Um, and, uh, and I think that smart devices will play a role in monitoring uh, the, this uh, movement and you know, extra activity. Yeah. Uh, I think that's an interesting, uh, an interesting one. If I think back to some of the yard work projects I was doing with my father growing up and uh, yeah, the, the sweat that you would break there. I think that's a great way to just do both things. You can make the world a better place. You can get more green into the neighborhood and you can be fit doing it. Uh, I think yeah. that would be a really good yeah, community initiative for a lot of operators to consider and start taking up. Um, yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Interesting one. Um, and, and do you think there's any specific verticals within the industry? So yeah, whether that be boutique or budget um, that you think need to be more proactive in, in changing their response to this pandemic? Uh, with, with, without doubt, the budget uh, should be uh, changing. Uh, so budget has expanded the industry um, without a doubt. Mm -hmm. um, and now it needs to expand uh, the people that it appeals to. Okay. Oh. And I think too, um, a, a big conversation uh, coming into the industry is for future trends and outlook. Uh, you know, the big, you know, we're talking about Apple already. So how they can yeah, maybe do more social good with, uh, with Apple Fitness Plus. Um, but how would you say a gym operator can leverage their own data or leverage some of their own initiatives to compete with them, compete with those options coming in that are also fighting for their members um, at the same yeah. time? Uh, you know, I don't, I don't really know uh, <laughs> is, the, is the real answer. Um, uh, I, I mean, so data is all around us. We know mm -hmm. that. And we also know that there's a mounting body of anecdotal evidence um, from a, around the country that shows that the pandemic has changed the way we move and exercise. 
And we also know that there's the convergence of physical and mental well-being has come to the fore. And more, and, and that also the more local, the better. So again, my example of those uh, sites in Scotland where everyone knows yeah. their name. Uh, so I would say that uh, we know that there have also been recent studies showing lower, lowering anxiety levels, boosting uh, immunity. Uh, exercise should now be viewed as preventative medicine and uh, psychological strength. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, yeah, I think that could be a, yeah, a good point for us to start, start ending. And those are the kind of long-term changes that we can look at um, and then be more personalized. I like the, the cheers comment there. So local clubs in Scotland, it's like walking into the, <laughs> into the cheers bar. Everyone knows everyone and it's a happy environment. huh? Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. Yeah. Well, David, uh, yeah. The great question to always ask as we, as we uh, finish up here, people who are interested in learning more about you, where can they go to find you and, and learn more about what you guys do as a business? Uh, it's um, leisuredv.com. Easy enough. Yeah. Yep. Awesome. All right. Well, David, it, it has been an absolute pleasure on here. I mean, you're, you're absolutely a, an industry legend. You have a lot of great insights and a lot of people uh, are always interested to hear those insights, a lot of big publications and that. So very genuinely appreciate you taking the time to join us today. And I hope you had a good it's conversation been great. as well. Alex, it's been great fun. Thanks for having me. Awesome. All right. Thanks, David. Take care. All right. This has been another episode of Fit Nation Lunch and Learn. We hope you all enjoyed this session and look forward to tuning in for the next one.